there are a couple of issues here. One is to uh, positions that are possible here. One is to say that Heidegger's philosophy as a whole actually has no connection to National Socialism as a political philosophy and a political practice. And the opposite position would be Faye's position. Uh, he's the fellow at Paris, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Who would argue that there's a tight integration between the philosophical theory and the philosophical practice. Uh, what's your view on that? I have mixed feelings. Uh, uh, Bernd Martin said, Heidegger could, could not apologize and could not confess doing anything wrong politically. Mm -hmm. Because if he were to admit wrongness politically, then it would be admitting wrongness philosophically. Right. Because, f as Martin pointed out, these things are together. Okay. So there is a theory practice connection on that view. Yeah. So, and that's a position that Fay is taking, and Ian Thompson at University of New Mexico is disagreeing with yeah. that position, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, another view though is if you, or a follow-up issue then, if you think there is an integration between the two, it would be a question which one comes first, right, in Heidegger's thinking. Is it that first he comes up with the theory and sees the political practice as a natural application of it, or were his commitments first political and cultural, and that he's backtracking into a philosophical theory that justifies it or in worst case, rationalizes it. Do you think he was first and foremost a philosopher or first and foremost a cultural activist thinker? God, that's a good question. Mm. My first impression would be that I think first and foremost he was a philosopher. But, you know, I have a master's degree in philosophy. I'm not a philosopher. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there are philosophers out there that would vehemently take one side or the other. I've read half of Emmanuel Fay's book, and I'm getting the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that he is leaning toward the, the politics driving the philosophy more than the philosophy driving the politics. That's correct, okay. yeah. In fact, his controversial thesis is, quite frankly, that uh, Heidegger's greatest sin is bringing Nazism politics into philosophy. Sure. All right. Let's go to uh, your, your making of the film. When did you first get serious about the project? Well, I'd been a Heideggerian, and I can remember uh, being in Germany. This was 1972 or 73, and I was just talking to a German buddy of mine, and uh, he was talking about some philosopher, and, uh, and oh, yeah, he was talking about, we were talking about Sartre. And I said, yeah, Sartre is, uh, you know, a key thinker and a great influence in my life, but Probably the most profound thinker of the 20th century was Martin Heidegger, a German. Mm -hmm. He looked at me and says, Heidegger? He's, you know, like his left hand, he says, Heidegger? Everybody knows Heidegger was a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And it blew me away. I, I, didn't, I had no idea that he was a Nazi. Uh, and, this, and what's interesting for American scholars, uh, Ian Thompson tells a wonderful story. He, he, t he studied under Bert Dreyfus at Berkeley. Mm -hmm and who is still there and, sure. and, and, and quite a Heidegger scholar. And he says, in that first semester, we studied Heidegger and we got into it and it was fascinating, his concepts of Zorga and, and authenticity and, and design, bis sum to design and, and stuff like that. And he says, and then in the second semester, he popped the bomb on us. Heidegger was a Nazi. Mm. And he said it was just mind boggling. And, uh, uh, and so, came this this whole thing about you know how do you deal with Heidegger's Nazism when at one level you think that he's a profound thinker mm. and that was my issue and uh, I, so I, I thought to myself well you know I understand the German point of view you know the, the, this kind of resentment of that other generation that brought us to Nazism and then in 1987 88 or 89 I read uh, Victor Farias's book right. And then I read Hugo Ott's book, right. and then I read Tom Rockmore's book, and I remember coming home and speaking to my wife, I said, you know that Heidegger was a Nazi? And uh, that was it. That was, I said, I'm going to make a film about this. Okay. And uh, Richard Wolin had also written a book at that time, and they all came out within two or three years of yes, another. Right. And uh, that was when, when Victor Farias' book, which is highly debatable and controversial because they say it's not very scholarly. Mm. But he did collect all of these sources together and he opened up the dam, broke, right. and, and Hugo Ott in the Zuricher Zeitung at that time in 1989 was saying, you know, the, the sky has fallen in France, you know, mm. it was an intellectual scandal because French philosophy is Heideggerian to the core. So, yeah. The postmodern thinkers. Yeah. You know. And, uh, and what's, what's interesting about Heidegger is 
you have those French philosophers on the right and those on the left, the Marxist as well as the absolutely that adopted elements out of out of Heidegger. So, and I said, well, that's it. And so I, I got a hold of Richard Wallen, who at that time was at Rice University. Mm. And I was teaching in the Department of Media Arts at uh, University of Arizona. And I said, would you be willing to come up and give a lecture? And then I'd like to interview you on camera. And he said, sure. And he came and, and uh, I got the history department, media arts, and philosophy, and I don't know what, some other department. And we packed this lecture hall of about 200 people. And he gave this great lecture, and it was a great debate. And then uh, I was director of the of the film and television studio at at the University of Arizona, and they have also a PBS station as mm -hmm. well. And I brought him into the studio, and I shot him uh, at that time. In I was a cineast and a real snob. I, I didn't use video. It was that three quarter umatic crap that mm -hmm. I couldn't stand. I shot it in sixteen millimeter film. Sure. And um, that's the black and white stuff that's right. in the documentary. <laughs> yes, and but it was originally in color. Ah, and um, uh, my wife's got ill, and her health turned bad, and and I took the 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 can uh, the negative, a uh, color negative, and I put it in storage, and it sat there for about 13, 12, 13 years, okay. and when I finally decided I'm going to continue, my wife's health had improved, and. I had taken this position in Germany, and uh, I resurrected the film, and it, it was green and purple colors that had deteriorated, so I was able to get it copied in black and white, ah. and that's why. Okay. Yeah. So the other people you interviewed, Hugo Ott, mm -hmm. um, uh, Emmanuel Fay, uh, Ian Thompson, Tom Rockmore, and, and a few others, when were most of those interviews done? Okay. Um, um, Richard Wolin was done in the in the towards the late '90s, yes. uh, and then um, I had scraped some money together, and some former students of mine who were camera people and technicians. I had a cameraman and, a, and a, an assistant and a sound man, and I uh, used my American Express credit card, and we flew to Germany with my wife, and you sort of used it as a quasi vacation. But at the same time, I went to Berlin and interviewed Victor Farias. Right. Okay, that was in 2002. And he was very animated in the documentary. Yes, yes. yeah. I mean, it, I took some things out that Faria said because they were so outrageous. Mm. And people told me, you've got to take that out. Even Emmanuel Fye said, <laughs> you've got to take that out. Uh, but as a filmmaker, Farias was wonderful because he was just so electrifying. Yes. And uh, then we went to Totenauberg. We shot footage there. We went to Freiburg University. And then um, uh, at that time, my wife and I decided, well, look, if we really want to do the film, we got to go back to Germany. And so that's when I, I got a position teaching at a college, which is on Lake Constance and not far from Meskirch. Mm. And so in 2003, then I interviewed Hugo Ott. Right. And then in 2004, because I was a teacher and I could only do it when I had a break, 2004, I interviewed Reiner Martin and uh, Bernd Martin. And then I did 2005 and six. Uh, uh, Tom Mo Tom Rockmore lives in France, oh. and he came to Germany. I interviewed him in my in my home in Germany, and then uh, Rockmore knew Emmanuel Fye, and he was kind enough. To, he's been a good friend and a supporter. And so then in 2005 or six, 2006, we went to Paris, shot Emmanuel Fye, and uh, Silke Seyman and I shot in 2007. And then I spent about a year and a half editing all of it. I mean, I just had hours and hours. My rough mm -hmm. cut was six hours. Sure. You also interviewed Ian Thompson. I believe that was in New Mexico. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, might interest filmmakers, this story. Um, I had no more money. Mm. And I'd read Thompson's book, which I thought was quite interesting. And I realized that my film was one-sided. I mean, I'll admit that. Because it's highly critical of Heidegger and his Nazism. But Thompson was one of these guys that was riding the fence. You know, he's saying, look, there's profound stuff that's of value. There's stuff we have to be critical and throw out. Mm -hmm. um, and I had read his book, and so uh, I could not afford to fly to New Mexico, get a crew, and go in there and shoot him. And then uh, it just turned out I thought I had this brilliant idea. Um, I called him up. We talked for a long time, 
And I said, look, it's much cheaper for me to call you on the phone. We can do a conference call. I contacted the head of the media department at the University of New Mexico, mm. and she set up the camera in Ian Thompson's office, and uh, he had a speakerphone here, and I was asking the questions in Germany, mm -hmm. and he was answering them on camera in New Mexico. And some of that stuff I had to edit because he kept forgetting, and he was always kind of looking down. Right. And when he was supposed to be looking at a, at a, uh, a, a dummy sitting in a chair, ah. pretending it was me. <laughs> So, uh, and, and, and the content of that interview was really fascinating. Much of it I couldn't use cinematically because he's just looking down. Mm. And, and I had a section in there and but somebody... I say the content is good. Yeah. And I had a section in there where somebody says, why is he looking down? And I realized, well, I... So I had to put in insert pictures. And, yeah.